Has your company just gone public, giving you a sudden influx of wealth? Have you been saving for the future and want to be sure you're managing wisely? Congratulations, and welcome to Wealth Unlocked with Tom Selbo of Landmark Wealth Management Group. Tom offers guidance to help you make the big decisions surrounding your finances, avoid costly mistakes, and build a strong financial foundation for your future. Let's get started. Your company is going IPO. Well, congratulations. And now you can stop the dancing because you have work to do. Tom Selbo understands just how much work too. He's helped other professionals navigate windfalls when their employer went public. I'm Patrice Sakora. And Tom, it is important to understand what happens when there is an IPO or initial public offering. So would you explain what that means first of all? Uh, absolutely. And yeah, welcome in. I'm, I'm excited here for this show. It's um just like a core of what I do. And I love helping people with this issue that they, they have when it comes up. But at its core, I won't go to get into the nitty gritty details. I mean, it's um, it can get quite boring, but, but at its core, when a company goes public, it's the process in our economy uh, by which a private company um, who, who's just functioning privately behind closed doors uh, gets listed on a public stock exchange where then uh, anybody, uh, you, Patrice, myself, anybody uh, in the public can then invest in that company. So it's it's just that process of going from a private company to a public company. And what I'd say is that the main reason companies do this is because they're, they're, they see expansion opportunities and they're looking to raise money. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'll just use a, a a silly example, but go ahead. It, yes. So silly, totally non-realistic example. But I mean, I, here in the Bay area, we, we just have an awesome food culture, great restaurants for, I mean, any kind of food you want. And uh, for example, down the street from my house, there, there's my favorite Mexican restaurant, Donnie Maria. I think they have the, the best burritos around. Mm -hmm. And, um, and again, I think they're, they're to die for, and they're just a, a hole in the wall, mom and pop private shop. And so for our silly example, I mean, say the, the owners of, of this restaurant say, you know what, we're here. We know we have the best burritos in the world. We sell maybe oh, a, a thousand burritos a day. And uh, you know what, if we could raise a million dollars, we could open 10 more shops. And I think we could sell uh, 10,000 burritos a day. And the, the, the company owners, the private company owners get together and say, yes, that sounds like a great idea. Let's, let's see if we can get our company to go public so we can get public interest and investors interested in, in investing in our company uh, who also believe in our awesome burritos and, and the product we have to, uh, to offer the world. So in a very silly way, that's, that is the process of a company going public. They're, they're looking to expand their business looking to get a wide variety of investors who, who believe in the product and think there's growth opportunities there to, to participate. Now, what does this mean for the employees though? So it, it could mean a number of things. Oftentimes, if you are a company or if you're an employee of a private company and they are rapidly expanding in the private sector, oftentimes the, the key employees especially will be given shares or or percentage interest in in the company and it's a way for the owners of the private company to give their employees a, 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 some some skin in the game yeah. exactly so they might um, and, and for example a, a smaller private company that's growing might not be able to pay their employees a huge salary but they can keep them around if they say you know what we're going to pay you your salary you're doing great work. We're growing. Uh, I'm going to give you a percentage interest in what we're building together. And when they do that, these the employees of the company, uh, not all of them, but the ones that get this incentive have a stake in the company. When the company goes public, their stake in the company, then um, they're, they are given in a very simple form, they're given a, a number of shares mm -hmm. uh, at the, the set listing price. So it just means that okay for for employees that that own private stock when their company goes public once it's on that exchange they now own shares that they could just go on their computer and click a button to sell and have money deposited in their bank account uh, if they want so there's just a 
when that happens, your wealth is kind of being, it's being unlocked in a sense where you are, uh, when it was, when you were in a private company, you, even though you have a percentage stake in the company, you can't necessarily sell it. There's not a market for it, but once it goes public, it's on a public exchange. You can sell it to anybody that's out there in the market for the price it's going for. And, uh, you have choices. So basically the company is giving you a promise that you can hopefully in the future redeem a coupon. You can redeem. Exactly. And then, and then the company goes public. They are listed on an exchange and you come into paper that is worth something. Absolutely. Um, it's just a, I call it just a massive liquidity event. And that's a, that's financial jargon, but it's, even though you might've had some value in a company that had some value, you couldn't sell it. So what did it matter? You could say, okay, it's worth a million dollars, but who's going to buy it? So you really don't have anything, but once it's on a public exchange, you have a massive market, uh, of, of the whole investing public, um, who might be willing to buy your shares for a certain price. So you just, you have choices to then hold or sell uh, a, a portion of your share to, to do what you'd like to do. Now, in all fairness to not to get into the weeds, but this doesn't happen overnight. I mean, you, the company may go public, but you may have to hold those pieces of paper for quite some time. Absolutely. And, uh, and I'll get into some of the details there of kind of the pit, pit, pitfalls to avoid and, and timelines right. and things like that. So if you know your company has decided to go public and you have these private shares that you know are going to go public, what you say there are three key things you should do. What are they? So three key things, and there's, and I'll just, I'll stick with the, the top three. One, you want to start a relationship with a, a fiduciary financial advisor. Two, you probably want to meet with a CPA or a tax accountant. And three, you might want to meet with an estate planning attorney depending on your scenario. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll go through just a little bit of detail on each of those. And, and in subsequent ep episodes, just we'll dive deeper into each of those areas. But from a high level, I, I, I listed them also in the order that I think it's important. One, meeting with a, a fiduciary wealth advisor or a, a financial. First, I'll just define fiduciary. I think that I put that in there. I think it's important. It just means that uh, it's an advisor who is held to the highest standard in the industry. They are required to do what's in your best interest. Um, there are lower standards in the industry, such as a suitability standard, things like that. But when you're meeting with uh, financial advisors, interviewing them, uh, it's important to ask, are you a fiduciary advisor? Uh, and just make sure that they are able to answer yes. So so one, starting that relationship. And I I view that as the most, most important for a, a couple reasons. One, I view the wealth advisor, the financial planner, kind of as the, the quarterback of your financial team. And things like the accountant, the attorney, they're, I, I kind of look at them as like your defense. <laughs> um, they're going to make sure, okay, we, we're not going to uh, pay too, more taxes than we need to. We're, we, if something happens to you, uh, you want to make sure your, your assets are, uh, avoid probate, go to your beneficiaries according to your wishes. But you're 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 playing defense in those regards, where a, a planner is is much more playing playing offense. We're looking at what's going on. We're looking at what you have, and we're looking forward. How can we optimize what you have to give you the best scenario about where you're going in the future? Whether it's I mean whatever your goals are, you want to buy a house, you want to retire, you might have charitable plans, or you want to give some money to your kids. We're looking down the road at your wishes and dreams. We're helping you formulate goals and playing offense to to get us there in the most efficient, uh, the efficient, most efficient way possible. And as the quarterback, we know when to pull in the accountant, when to pull in the attorney, uh, when when appropriate. Okay. Yeah. So I, that's that's the biggest thing. And I I also I'll also just use this example or or analogy. I think the financial planner is is kind of like a general contractor of, of your financial life. You hire them to come in and, and help build your financial life. And in this scenario of, okay, your, your company's gone public in, in a lot of cases that I've seen, it's um, it, when that event happens, it's a shock to the financial system of, of your personal financial life right, right. Um, and, and in a good way, but it needs to be managed properly. And 
this again, it's maybe not the best example. I'm just thinking of this, but for, um, here in California, we have, we unfortunately have earthquakes. Um, <laughs> have you, have you experienced an earthquake? Patrice? No, I, I actually a small one, but never one of the big ones that you guys have. Okay. And I, yeah, I actually have yet to experience a, a real live big one, but even the small ones are, uh, they're nerve wracking. <laughs> things, things start shaking and you, you're like, I mean, the classic things, okay, get it. We, we used to do this in, in school here because we're so used to being prepared for out here. That's our nat- natural disaster. But okay, you get under the desk, you get under the table. And anyways, it's no fun. Whenever I experience them, I it, it starts shaking a little bit and I'm always just expecting it just to break loose. But it, yeah. Uh, so far, it, it hasn't. But uh, anyways, we have earthquakes here. So when your company goes public, it's a good thing, or an earthquake is a negative thing. But I'll, I'll use the example. Your company goes per- uh, goes public. You have this liquidity event. Now you have some options in front of you. And it's a, it's a shock to your system. It's kind of like so, some level of an earthquake happened in your financial life. And your, your house either, maybe it was just very very minor shock to the system. Foundation got shook a little bit and you might go in and say, okay, we now that this has happened, I have this money. Uh, we need to kind of rebuild the foundation, but we don't need to do anything drastically different if it's not a huge amount of money. Uh, on the other hand, maybe this there's a shock to your system where your company goes public and you all of a sudden have millions and millions of dollars. A huge so, earthquake. It, yes. So it's almost like, okay, your, your financial life, the, the house has, uh, the playing field has been leveled and we need to rethink totally what your plans were before because uh, something new has happened and we need to rebuild in a different way. So um, I think by as, as the general contractor or, or financial planner, they're just a key person on your team to kind of know, okay, what do we need to rethink that you've been doing a certain way? What have you been doing that still makes sense even in light of this windfall? And let's just make sure we're, we're optimizing that. So that again, the the financial planner, the the first one in my view. All right, but then the CPA, the tax accountant, and then the estate planning attorney. Is it how do you bring in somebody at that stage in time? They don't really know you, and you really at this point in time, you may not know yourself. Exactly. So, but the the key thing again, it comes back to having that financial planner at the end, the the advisor as your the key relationship you have where the advisor will often have have estate planning attorney connections. They'll know when to bring that attorney in. Mm-hmm. And, and in most cases, you'll want to bring the attorney in if you're going to, you have a big influx of wealth. Now you, uh, you had private stock that wasn't necessarily worth anything. Now you have actual real value on paper that is a part of your estate. So if something happens to you, you need to make sure, right. okay, Am I going to have an estate tax problem if if I don't title these things correctly? If I pass away, is is a big chunk of it going to be gone because it has to go through the courts and through probate to help figure out who's going to get the shares? Mm-hmm. And there's just those the, the, the attorney is a, a key person on certain clients' teams to make sure that the that everything is optimized. But I I put them kind of as the the third on my list of importance, not that it's not important and it's always client by client, but uh, oftentimes th- there are people who are in this scenario where, okay, their company goes public, they get some shares, but it's not a, uh, it's not a huge shock to their system. They don't need to run out and pay an attorney to do something. And the, the financial planner is the quarterback. It can be a great resource to guide you on, okay, th- is it worth spending the money to, to do an estate plan or uh, is there simpler ways you can go about making sure some of those things are in order? Right. How much is it, time does an employee typically have before they, um, they to get their ducks in a row? They may be they, they know they have these these private shares, but then the word comes, okay, we're going public. How much time do they have in general? Yeah. So in in general, and I, I've I've worked with many clients that have gone through this process, and usually what happens, it's not always the case, but usually maybe 18 months to a year before the company is going to go public. Nothing's for sure, but word starts getting around, uh, starts getting around the office. You start seeing new people in suits showing up uh, <laughs> uh, with their briefcases and, uh, and and the bosses are meeting with them. And um, 
you start to get a sense, okay, and, and you, you will know as an employee of one of these companies, you know, we're doing really well. We're growing like crazy. We've been hiring new employees like crazy. And you start to, you'll start to just have a, a feeling and the word will get out. Mm-hmm. That usually happens, again, 18 months to a year before. It doesn't mean anything is set in stone. There's lots of things that can derail a uh, company going public. It's a complex process behind the scenes. But I'd say a year before, you, you start to get word. You'll also sort of have an idea of, of how many shares you have. What it, You'll start to get whisperings of what the company's worth. You can sort of do the math of, okay, what do I own? What are they going to try and bring it public for? And you get a, a feeling for what your share might be worth. I, I'd say once you... Once those whisperings start happening, it's nothing has happened yet. Uh, you don't want to count your eggs before you've had they've hatched. But it's a good time to start just building a relationship with a financial planner and and getting that going beforehand. You don't want to you don't want your company to go public and then you're scrambling to try to figure out what to do. It's a good problem to have, but if you don't handle it properly. I'm thinking you could really, there could be a big problem. You could have a huge lost opportunity. What are some of the the downsides to people who, or for people who have not really paid attention and just said, oh, well, I'm going to have money? Yeah. So there's, uh, I'll outline a couple problems. Um, And some of them are a little bit extreme. I've never run across them, but they're highly possible. Uh, So big problem number one, when your company goes public, you're, depending on the windfall amount, whether it's small or large, there's always going to be a tax bill to pay. Mm-hmm. So with that in mind, it, if you're paying zero attention and you're not looking at any of this stuff and your company goes public and, okay, great, now I can sell my shares. You sell all your shares and you say, you know what? I've worked hard for this company. I'm going to take a year off and I'm just going to, I'm going to spend this money and just live it up. You and Uncle Sam. Yes. So you, you can go, you can find yourself in a spot where if you didn't plan for the taxes mm. and you you spend the money, okay, well, you spent the money, the tax bill is going to come due sooner rather than later. And you better hope you have some money elsewhere to pay it. And if you don't, you could be in real trouble. Yeah. So you could imagine the problems that could happen if you're not planning for, for the taxes one of the bigger things that I run into as a problem, and I'll, um, I came across this at, at the end of December, uh, December 2021, a, an article came out from Barron's. Uh, they're they're a, just a big financial publication, well-respected. And they were talking about IPO activity in 2021. And 2021 was the largest year for IPO activity. Uh, over 1,000 companies went public. That went public last year in 2021. Yes, and it's the yes. So it was the it was the largest IPO activity uh, since they started tracking this data. And what they found is that 64 percent of the companies last year that went public are now trading lower Mm -hmm. than where they where they were on their IPO date. So in other words, that the company goes public on, on day one, say it's uh, $100 a share for these companies. Today, more than half of them are trading lower than uh, what they were. So if you owned these shares, if you did nothing and you just held on to them, your, your value now is lower than the day they went public. A huge job for me as, as a financial advisor is helping you control risk. And I think when your company goes public, oftentimes these the the influx of shares you get all of a sudden represents a very large portion of your personal wealth i've seen scenarios where uh, you just have normal rank and file people working they're just saving for retirement their company goes public now you look at their personal balance sheet and um, 90% of their wealth is now tied up in this one stock Ooh. so Again, not a bad problem to have, but if you're not planning for it, and in this scenario where, okay, this last year, more than half of these companies have dropped in value since the day they went public, you you want to look at diversifying and making sure this huge portion of your personal wealth isn't tied up in, in one company. Does that make sense? 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you're always told, too, when uh, you're working for a public company, yeah, you can buy their stock if you want, but don't make that the only investment that you have. Exactly. So a huge, just a huge thing to avoid, and, and again, where a financial advisor can help is to help you control that risk. I'm, I always have benchmarks that I'll throw out for my clients. I, I think if you're, if you're younger, and depending on the company, say, okay, you want to try to get it so no more than 10% of your wealth is in any given company. Uh, as you get older, closer to retirement, I like that number to be no more than 5%. I mean, closer to two or three if possible. But you get in these scenarios where, okay, 90% of your wealth is in one stock now. Um, we need to be methodical and plan for how we're going to diversify away from that because they're, you don't just want to go ahead and sell it all right away necessarily. You might want to do it in chunks mm -hmm. to, to avoid taxes, to be tax wise, things like that. But you also, you're talking about planning, and that is so totally important, because here, there's something called the lockup, where you're not going to be able to sell your stock just yet. You have to wait, and you may see that stock open at its IPO price and then drop. Don't worry about it. It's There's nothing you can do anyway. Exactly. And it's a good point you bring up, and I, I won't get into the, the details of this, but in, in today's world, there's there's two ways that companies go public. There's the traditional way where there are these, uh, usually it's a six month lockup. So uh, you, as a, a holder of private shares, you might be entitled to sell a portion like within the first week of it going public, but you won't be able to sell all your shares. There's usually then a six month period where you have to hang on and, and nothing you can do. Sweat um, it out. <laughs> sweat it out. Yep. Um, and before you can do anything uh, the other ways, and a lot of companies are doing this now, there's there's the traditional way of going public. Now there's also what's called direct listings, where companies, they it's kind of like the Wild West, but they don't go through a traditional investment bank. They just say, you know what, we're going to offer our shares directly to the public, and we're just going to see what the market will bear. We're going to see what the price is, and we tr we trust our, our product and the demand for, for investment in our company enough to do that. And when they do that, the, the lockup periods are oftentimes a little bit different. Sometimes employees can dump all their shares day one if they wish. What does happen though is, because uh, I've seen this, there's no restriction on the amount of shares you can sell day one, but maybe after the first week of trading, you're then locked up until each quarterly earnings call comes out. So you kind of get this window for a number of years where you have you get locked through the quarter, you have to wait for the information to become publicly available before you as a quote, uh, kind of an insider are able to, to dump any more or buy any more of, of the shares. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's being methodical about that. And, and it also just is a huge, huge benefit to have a financial planner on your side to, uh, to help you control the emotional roller coaster. Uh, you, you mentioned this, I mean, you're in, in these lockup periods, and, and even if it's not locked up, it's a, one of these weeks where you're able to sell your shares if you want, you might be seeing the price fluctuate dramatically. And you have to have someone on your team that's, that's objective, can give you good objective advice without the emotion that you're going to be feeling when you're seeing your value fluctuate greatly. Yeah. And don't listen to your brother-in-law. No. <laughs> Please, no. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, we're, we're kind of running out of time here a little bit, but is there any other point that you wanted to make some of the issues that might develop? You have some good ones here. No, I think um, the biggest ones would be you want to get ahead of this. You want someone on your team that can help you avoid the tax problems, someone who can be on your team to help you navigate the emotional roller coaster. And then just someone on your team that can help you see the landscape ahead. So you kind of know the possibilities. Okay, here's this is my new reality. The, the landscape may look different now that my company's gone public than it did prior. So what does that mean for my life? Can I, uh, when do I want to retire? Can I now retire earlier? Can I buy a bigger house? Maybe I have charitable intent and there's great strategies we can use um, in this scenario too, to support the causes that are important to you. Uh, so I think just getting someone on your team like that is just going to keep you on the right track and uh, more importantly, just help avoid the really big pitfalls that might come along the way. Tom, that sounds great. Now, how can people reach you if they've got some questions and if they are lucky enough to be looking at an IPO? 
You can reach me at landmarkwealth.com or Tom Selbo at landmark.com. All right. That's Tom Selbo, S-E-L-B-O, your host for Wealth Unlocked. Follow this podcast to know when the latest show is ready for you. And of course, share it with friends and family. They could probably use it. I'm Patrice Sikora, and let's talk again later. Thank you for listening to the Wealth Unlocked podcast with Tom Selbo. Click the follow button to be notified when new episodes become available. And follow us on LinkedIn and Facebook at Landmark Wealth for all podcast updates. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Landmark Wealth Management Group. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning.